This might sound like a great solution, but it's not so simple. <coughs> Asymmetric encryption um, such as this is significantly slower than symmetric. Uh, there are also message size limits. For example, RSA encryption. Um, when using RSA encryption, a key of 2048 bits can only encrypt at most 245 bytes. So which brings us to public-private key exchange. This is specific to Diffie-Hellman. Um, I was reviewing my slides with a, uh, someone more well-versed in encryption than I am this morning, and they told me that this isn't perfectly right. But the idea here is that um, you use um, two different keys to securely agree upon a shared um, symmetric key. Um, so it, this is the way in which things like HTTPS or TLS or SSL work or IPsec, um, they'll use, things like this will use certificates um, which, have, which will have public-private keys in them, and they use that as part of the handshake to agree upon a single symmetric key that's used for the rest of the encryption from there on out. So yes, but actually no. So suppose that I'm Alice in this scenario. Um, with this key exchange, I can be sure that my communication is, my communication with whoever claims, eh, let me start over, I'm sorry, everybody. So suppose that I'm Alice in this scenario. Um, with this key exchange, I can be sure that my communication with whoever claims to be Bob is secure, but how do I know that that person claiming to be Bob really is Bob? If I'm logging into my Google account over HTTPS, can I be sure that the server on which, on the other end, is actually Google and not just someone, some server saying, yep, I'm Google, give me your password. So this is where uh, web, of trust, web of Trust comes into play. Um, if you know me and trust that I am who I say I am, and your friend trusts you, then your friend can trust my claim of identity by proxy. This can be done by way of uh, signing people's public keys, which is sometimes done at, a, at key signing parties. But this doesn't scale well. And not everyone is as careful in pub signing public keys. Uh, I may know you and trust that you are who you say you are, but can I trust that you are selective in who you trust? Um, I swear there's an XKCD cartoon out there for everything. I don't know who here follows XKCD. Um, which brings us to public key infrastructure. There are three main types of PKI. Uh, we briefly spoke about the web of trust, which is what you see with PGP encryption. Uh, there's SPKI but I won't dig into that one. It's not super commonly used, and, um, and I want to keep the, the conversation focused. And then there are, and the one I'd like to discuss, discuss are certificate authorities. Certificate authorities, which are also called CAs, are in a broad sense very similar to the web of trust, except, with, except by the fact that very specific individuals or parties are designated as trusted third parties. A certificate authority I did not use great colors or font size on this, is used by everyone in the web of trust, but not everyone in the web of trust is trusted by everybody else. In this graph, the black lines with arrows on both ends indicate mutual trust. The blue lines with arrows at one end indicate one-way trust. Rando person on the internet at the top, uh, number one, um, uh, trusts the certificate authority and trusts Alice um, but the certificate authority and Alice don't trust rando on the internet number one. You may ask, well, how do we all trust the certificate authority? How is that trust established in the first place? So let's think about Windows or your cell phone or any of these other devices that, that you buy. They come prepackaged with a public certificate from a certificate authority. The certificate authority will then issue, which usually means sells, certificates to parties like Alice and Bob, who can then prove that they are who they claim to be. Um, the, the Alice and Bob or uh, bankofwhatever.com will prove to the certificate authority, and this proof is usually done offline in, in less technical means. Um, this proof can be, um, for, for businesses that I've worked at before, I've had to get our certificates issued to us, and I had to go to a public notary, get my thumbprint taken and all that. Um, a while back, I had a startup, and we decided to get an EV cert. An EV cert stands for Extended Validation, <clears throat> and those were the certificates where you see the entire business name um, uh, next to the green lock icon. So it's more than just the lock, it's the whole business name. 
And when I got our EV cert, not only did I have to prove who I proved that my company was who it said it was, but I had to go get my articles of incorporation or some other business filing, get my uh, get it notarized, get my corporate lawyer to write a letter with the exact verbiage. And it got kicked, that one letter got kicked back to me several times because there were, like the comma wasn't in the right place. Um, so it was, it was a real pain. Um, and then my lawyer had to provide his, his um, uh, attorney license number. <clears throat> so that's um, how this trust is established between certificate authorities and uh, people who want certificates. But going back to this, um, when the certificate authority is satisfied with a proof of identity, they will issue a certificate to Alice uh, or Bob with a certificate authority signature on it. Because all these randos trust all these randos, rando number one, rando number two, rando number three, because they all trust the certificate authority, certificate authority and they see that Alice and Bob have certificates with the certificate authority signature, they therefore trust the identity of Alice and Bob. So changing gears a little bit, um, so far we've gone over the implementation details of encryption. Uh, let's talk about kind of how to integrate it. Let's pre pretend that we have a network diagram like this. Um, it's got a cloud. Okay, good. All network diagrams have to have a cloud. Um, we have a couple of database servers, we have a web server, we have an application server, some firewalls, and what looks like a user's laptop. By the way, I kind of hate network diagrams like this. I think that they really don't tell us a whole lot, but I see them pop up in documentation, security white papers, I see them pop up all the time. Managers love this. Uh, but anyway, let's suppose that someone says, oh, hey, um, this is great, but can you put a lock on everything where there's encryption? you end up with diagrams that look like this. I've seen this quite a bit, and you know, managers or auditors will go, this is great, everything's encrypted, we're protected, check the box, ship it. Um, th this is disgusting to me because it doesn't help us understand what the actual security posture of the system or the network is. So let's look at uh, a more simplified network. Uh, this is a user laptop or just a user. Um, it's like you or I connected to a Wi-Fi access point at home or in a coffee shop, and we're going to some website online, and that website has a SQL database, and that SQL database might have user info in it. <coughs> um, maybe there's a lock on the database diagram because we have a checklist, because the company that runs the website has a checklist that says, you must encrypt your data at rest. At rest means on disk. Okay, done. We put a lock on it. We good, right? So from this diagram, can we tell anything about that encryption? Maybe it's full disk encryption. Maybe it's transparent database encryption or column level encryption. Maybe it's AES encryption, done well or done poorly, or maybe it's ROT13. Um, you know, in, in lurking on um, Stack Exchange cryptography, I've literally seen people say, I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years as an engineer and when I started, ROT13 was considered good enough by most engineers um, 30 or 40 years ago. I've seen people say that. I don't know if it actually was considered good enough. Hopefully it never was. But there's a large, uh, there were a large amount of engineers 30 years ago that said, yeah, good enough. And there are still some of those, those legacy systems out there. Speaking of legacy si systems, slight tangent. Um, I tried to sign up for a JetBlue account uh, a couple of years ago, and they had a, a weird password restriction. They said that your password cannot contain the letters Q or Z. And it's because, it's because the, their password system was um, legacy uh, touch tone on the phone, and phones don't have Q and Z. <laughs> so they've, they've since updated that system, but this was only like five years ago. Um, so, you know, by putting a lock on there, that might mean that it's, it's, it's you know, uh, AES encryption with all the settings done right, or it could mean that it's ROT13. We really don't know. So let's suppose that we have disk level encryption turned on. Then all of your data on disk is encrypted. But if you open up your SQL manager and you run a select star from customers table, something like this. Uh, this is what someone logs into the machine will see. So your disk encryption doesn't protect you in this case. Uh, your disk 
your full disk encryption really only protects you from someone stealing your disks or someone who has physical access to the disk. Um, and this is certainly what your web application is going to see. Um, your web application is running on your, on your web server. When your web application is interacting, running SQL statements um, with your database, this is what it looks like to the application. This means that if your web application is vulnerable to SQL injection attacks, hopefully it's not, but there are a lot of um, applications out there that are. And in some organizations, the person who is responsible for administrating the, the database is not the same person responsible for writing the web application. So if your web application is uh, vulnerable to SQL injection, then this is what um, you know, attackers can, can exfiltrate. So full disk encryption doesn't really protect you against these attacks. So now let's suppose that you have uh, that you're running Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise, and I just speak to that because as a .NET engineer, that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, SQL Server Enterprise offers something called transparent data encryption. Uh, we don't typically think of databases as files, but at the end of the day, they are. And with transparent data encryption, the data that's actually in the file is encrypted, um, which means that if someone gets onto your system, maybe they're the administrator, they, they get in as the admin, and they want to copy off the database file to a, um, to a thumb drive, or maybe someone logs in as a, as a separate user and they're trying to drag files across uh, user folders, then that data will be encrypted. But uh, because it's transparent data encryption, what that means is the encryption is transparent to, the, um, to both someone using a SQL Server Management Studio or to the web application. So again, this encryption doesn't protect you against all the different types of attacks. So let's suppose that we have column level encryption enabled and have encrypted the credit card column. If you open up your SQL browser and do select star on your customer's table, you'll see something like this. You can see the credit card numbers are encrypted. Uh, and in order for your application to decrypt them, you must use the right um, certificate, which is stored in the, uh, the, the Windows. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there are, there are secure methods to manage your, your encryption and decryption keys in Windows with SQL Server. Uh, so this will definitely protect you against um, uh, SQL injection attacks. If someone pops your application and they don't know which certificate or what the, uh, what the key name is, then this is what they'll get. So topics that I have not discussed so far are more on block ciphers. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole, someone could give a whole presentation on any one of these things, initialization vectors, key management. I didn't touch at all on message authentication codes and that is um, data that's appended to the end of your encrypted message. If I send you an encrypted message, um, you know, an, atta an attacker in between might have twiddled some bits and changed it. As the recipient, you don't really have a good way to know if that message has been tampered with unless there is a message authentication code. And then there are, of course, side channel attacks. Um, uh, side channel attacks are uh, what I alluded to with ECB, that is, if an attacker knows that um, large chunks of your, um, your files are all zeros, then they can use that to kind of reverse engineer what your encryption key is. Um, and then I didn't talk at all about uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Again, I've seen whole talks that are an hour long just on that. And I didn't talk at all about hashing. Um, those are all good things, but in the, in the name of time, I want to kind of open it up to questions. And in conclusion, Encryption is not magic pixie dust. Don't roll your own. Use well-established libraries, services, or consider pulling in um, experts and consultants. And just because your data is encrypted and it has a lock on it in the diagram doesn't mean it's safe. Understand your threat model and use the correct encryption methods and use them correctly. Any questions? I don't know who here is a uh, Saturday Night Live fan. But it is October, so. Yes. What sort of place do you have to find them? Um, that's a good question. I found that um, it's usually good to explain to them why you have to kind of roll your own. And by roll your own, in this case, I mean write your own code. Um, I was recently working on a project where um, all of our product security said, oh, just use IPsec. And that was kind of a non-starter because of XYZ reasons. 
And then our um, product security team said, oh, use um, just TLS. And that was a non-starter for other technical reasons. So uh, make sure that when you go to bring in the consultants that you have a, a well-prepared explanation for why it is that you want to roll your own and, and kind of explain to them the motivations and then hopefully they can steer you in the right direction. So, any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Are, are there other resources for learning cryptography or? Like the cryptography behind the Parker dongle? Um, I wish I could answer that. Um, I'm sure there are. There aren't any that I'm aware of. Um, if anyone else in the room knows, I, you won't be stealing my thunder if you answer that. Um, uh, like I said at the beginning of this talk, I'm not an expert in cryptography. This was more me talking about all the ways that I've learned not to fuck it up from the perspective of a software engineer. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to you more about the specifics afterwards. OK, I guess um, if there's no other questions, thank you. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, I am Failbridge. <laughs>